So recently I got into playing D&D, &D, and I've not played Dungeons and Dragons or any RPG really like tabletop style since I was in high school. And I had this teacher, and I won't say his name just for, you know, his disclosure, but let's call him Mr. X. And Mr. X was cool. He had so much tenure that he could pretty much do whatever he wanted, say whatever he wanted. But uh, other than that, he was just like a super good educator, and... He taught you know, mythology and science fiction class, uh, but like every other week or so, we would have um, club day in school. And my junior year, I was in RPG club, which was ran by Mr. X. And he would pull out, you know, like some pre-made sheets and stuff like that uh, of characters we could play as, and we'd all gather up around his desk, and he would DM. <laughs> the first... The, the one thing I remember most is somebody, I believe I tossed my sword and at a dragon and it went inside the dragon like a, the dragon ate it and so another person in the party decided that they would get it but they rode like a one, like a critical one and they ended up in the dragon's butt yeah that was Mr. X for you he was just that was his imagination it just you know everything was dirty and it was funny but like it was you know level enough to be from a high school teacher to this day that's one of my favorite teachers but so it's been 12 13 years or so or 14 can't really remember now since I was in high school and played an RPG club, and I recently started playing again with some friends, and uh, I'm the type of person now that when I get into something, I sink into it way, way too much, like, especially when, like, I'm really in it, like, I've already bought miniatures, and I've started painting them, and, you know, I, which is good, because I needed to work on my miniature painting anyways, and 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 getting better at that regardless and um, I've always play I always play as a heavy in like almost any game I play so for myself I got a paladin uh, I've been writing in a journal like all of the details of the campaign we've been playing like my inventory and everything and I know most of this is like a provided for you on a character sheet but I just figured I'd track it all you know my first playthrough and I don't know maybe do something with this journal one day but like I said I go all in so I bought a monster manual and I've got these glasses they're like magnifying glasses but they don't really work well uh, I'm gonna have to look for something else because you put them on, and, and if you want to see up close, you have to hold hold the thing like right here in front of your face. That just don't work. What I really wanted to do, since I like being a creative person, well, at least I think of myself as a creative person, but also somebody that can like write stories or or, or lead people on in a story. Anyways, um, I picked up my first campaign. Now, this is Fendelver and Below, and for my first set of D, D videos which this will be a series drawn out over you know however many years or whatever but for my first one this is my first campaign and i wanted to play with miniatures the guys that i'm playing with now they've never played with miniatures or terrain or anything like that so i feel like i have the capabilities like i'm able body enough to provide that for players that have been playing it for a long time and it just brings something new and interesting for them as well so you know like the whole experience of actually playing like sitting down and playing a campaign is new for me but playing with terrain and miniatures and stuff is new for them so anyways today we're going to delve into the Fandelver and below the shattered obelisk and i'm going to start making terrain for this now the only bad part about this is that um, if 
some of the players that I am going to be DM for. Watch this. There's really no hidden secrets, especially like later on when I get into like the K's and stuff like that. But I'm going to try my best not to disclose anything that might give a player advantage just by watching. So if you're playing and you're running through the same campaign and your DM or you guys decide to make this terrain, you, you can do that without knowing any of the details of the story. To an extent, because I still want it to be interesting enough that people are going to watch. Yeah. So, anyways, yeah. Now I'm into D and D. Like I really needed something else. So I had figured I'd came up with this really good idea to make these things I wanted to call battle tiles. It was basically just some XPS foam, 7 inch by 7 inch honeycomb. And in D&D, &D, 1 inch is equal to 5 feet. So I figured 7 inches would give me 35 feet. And that's the majority of characters' movement speeds. What I forgot to realize was that a honeycomb is not an octagon. So at this point, you're going to want to change your template to a hexagon and not an octagon because a honeycomb is six sided, not eight sided. You know, hindsight's 2020 and it still gets the job done. But with a honeycomb, all your results and all your ends are going to snap together and you'll have a nice fluid flush terrain versus having holes in it like I ended up at the end. And all of this can be done fairly easy with some half inch XPS foam and a box cutter or exacto knife. Now the next thing to do is just cut out a few more of these tiles and then we can start with our layout. Now in the campaign this is the first map that you will see and the first encounter for your players. It's called the Road to Phandalin or the Goblin Ambush. The map is shown to be approximately 95 feet long, but with three of our battle tiles we get 105 feet, which is plenty of space for us to lay out our road and then this little trail that leads north into the woods. To texture the terrain I'm going to use a combination of beating it with a rock that I found outside and this little trick I picked up from Boy Light Hobby Time, which is to deface the terrain using a butane torch. Now I will warn you that this does slightly melt the foam and it is some form of toxic gas that you probably shouldn't inhale. So do this in a well ventilated area or with a respirator on. In the book it said that there's supposed to be a muddy embankment on each side of the road. In order to achieve this we're going to use these corners that we cut off of all our little pieces of our hexagons and we're going to glue them to the outermost edge of each side and then put another tile on top to give us roughly an inch of elevation which adds up to about five feet. If you ask me that's a pretty steep embankment and it should work for the cause. To break up the lines in between the layers of the XPS foam I like to use a combination of my X-Acto knife, a hot wire cutter and that lucky rock that I brought inside. You can do this in any fashion that you want, but I like to give it that sandstone slash limestone look to where it's natural form layers within the earth. Do the same thing to the top of the terrain with that butane torch or the rock, and before too long, you have something that looks like terrain before it's even painted. Now I follow a strict order of the crafting code which is to use every tiny little piece of material that I can before it goes into the incinerator. With that being said, I'd like to take a few more of those triangular pieces that we cut off the edges of our hexagons, even though these are octagons, and I'm just going to use my fingers to pinch pieces of the foam off on the edge and then beat it desperately with this rock until they look like boulders or stones protruding out of the terrain. I like that boulder. That is a nice boulder. With a little bit of hot glue and a little bit of imagination, you can actually make a lot of these scrap pieces of material go a very long ways.
After about 20 solid minutes of finagling, I'd finally made me enough boulders to hunk onto the terrain, and it was time to move on to basing these tiles. For my terrain, I always like to mix tile mortar and water together into a decently thick consistency, almost like peanut butter. Then I take my finger or a sculpting blade or whatever's handy and spread it onto the terrain. This actually works pretty well because you get a gritty, dirty looking terrain base without hardly any effort at all. I know that sometimes with things like plaster and stuff like that, you have to use something like a sponge or what have you to texture it. And with mortar, it's just a, uh, you know, two birds, one stone scenario. And uh, anytime I can find an out into doing something like that, that's what I'm all for. Make it easy, make it simple, and keep it lazy. All in all, it's a pretty straightforward process. There's not really any way you can truly mess this up. If you want it to be thicker, just add more mortar, and if you want it to be thinner, add more water. Once the mortar is dried, I seal it all with a mix of Mod Podge and black acrylic paint. Now you could use brown, I just like to use black because I can see where I've painted and where I have it. And it also does a little pre-shading for me when I want to go ahead and start putting different colors of paint on my terrain. Then once all that's dried, I go in with the dark gray and I dry brush all the stone works on the tiles. And I love dry brushing. That's the best part about taking your time to add texture to something, is the results when you're dry brushing. It's just so satisfying. Uh, really, there's nothing like it. I decided to try something a little different when I was painting the mud and stuff for this terrain. I used a burnt umber and watered it down, and I figured that I'd do different shades of washes with watered down acrylic paints as I brought to life the mud, and that would help me give the different depths and layers to the look of it. My only problem was is that I was running out of paint, so I just had to go ahead and slap it on a little bit thinner than what I would have liked to have done. But at the end of the day, it got the job done. I always like to go in with some green paint and lay out where I'm gonna put my flocking. Not only does this help create some depth, it also saves on using so much flocking because when I lay it out a little thinner, it's green beneath and I don't have to use so much. And saving on your flocking means saving money, and we all gotta love that. Now I thought it'd be pretty cool to use this gloss Mod Podge and spread it really lightly on all the really low areas of the mud to make it look like puddles were starting to form or that the groundwater was leaching out in these areas. Something to just give it just a little bit more character and just a little bit more depth. You want to make this terrain cheap and simple and you also want to make it fast. Because if you're like me, you only have a week until the next session you're going to play to try to pop out some terrain. So cheap, fast, and easy is the three things that you're looking for most here. Regardless, I think in the end, this turned out great and I cannot wait to use this again. Assuming you've never done flocking before, it's fairly simple. You just spread some Mod Podge or any type of PVA glue onto the top of your terrain in a medium consistency and then you take whatever flocking you're going to use and you can pinch it with your fingers and just kind of drizzle it all over the place or you can do what some of the professionals do in this league which is buy one of like a flour strainer or like a powdered sugar shaker and use that to get a better consistency and probably not waste as much I'm just I, I'm just always looking for the cheapest way to do something and using my fingers versus spending three bucks for some type of strainer works fine for me however it might be a little different for you but when it comes to adding flocking to a piece like this it really starts to add life and character to it and you can start to see more develop than just a hunk of foam in front of your face once I have all the green flocking on, I take my static grass and I mix it together with a couple different blends and lengths and I put it in a static grass applicator. I put the needle into the wet PVA glue and I just shake it vigorously across the whole piece. 
just be wary if you are using a static grass applicator because I've never done this and not shocked myself at least once or twice. Once all my static grass is on, I then go back with a little bit darker shade of flocking than what I'd used previously and I sprinkle it into the static grass while it's still wet. This really helps seed the illusion that this grass is a lot more thick and dense than the other grass. After all my grass has had time to dry, I pull out them road tiles again and I put a heavy coating of PVA glue along the dirt path. You want this thick so that it holds on the basalt or the rocks or whatever that you're going to be using as the main road or the main trail for your terrain. And if you're a little bit wishy-washy like me about if that's even going to stay on or not, the best way to secure this down is to use a little bit of isopropyl alcohol and squirt it all over the top of the rocks. Then you can go back with some watered down PVA glue and squirt it on top of that and the iso alcohol is going to help that glue seep down into all those little spaces in between the rocks and really penetrate and hold on to everything tight once it dries. Believe me, I know it seems like it wouldn't work, but it works. You can even tip it upside down and tap on the bottom of it after and you're not going to lose any of your terrain. It's a lovely thing to do. Now before we go any further, I'm going to overlay the map out of the book, that way we can see what's going on and what type of foliage and other bits of hard terrain we need to add in order to make this look believable. Now granted it is on tiles and we can move things around a bit as we need to, but for this instance we want it to look as close as we can get with using as less materials as possible. Now as we can see on the map, there is a bit of dense heavy wooded foliage to the north of the road and to the south of the road it's not so dense but still a little thick. On the actual road itself, before you get to the edges of the slope bank, you can see that there's shrubs and a little bit of dense foliage there as well, maybe some bushes or briars or whatever. For this I'm going to be using clump foliage. I adhere the foliage to the terrain using hot glue and then I use that method of isopropyl alcohol and watered down Mod Podge to seal everything in and make sure that it all sticks together and binds to the bottom. As for the trees I'm going to attempt to make three. I'm going to use some copper wire and cut about five inch length pieces until I have a whole mess of them. I'm going to chuck them into my drill and give it a crank and spoil them together about halfway up the length. Then I'm going to branch off, individually wrap the wires together to form branches until I have something that starts to look like a tree. Then I'm going to roll out a little bit of Super Sculpey and wrap it around the wires like a hot dog bun and use a clay sculpting tool and start forming bark and different textures along the base of the tree. Once all my sculpting was done and I pulled my little trees out of the oven, I threw on some black acrylic paint to lay down a base layer and seal the clay. I gave the trees a dark burnt umber wash, trying to dry brush as much as possible. Then I went back through and dry brushed everything with a dark chestnut. I stuck the trees in a box and then used a spray adhesive at a rattle can and sprayed the limbs and the branches of the tree and started to apply clump foliage to different parts of the branches. This actually works pretty well for me and if you're worried about pieces of the tree falling off you can always use the isopropyl alcohol and watered down Mod Podge trick. It'll help seal everything and keep it steady. At the end of this long drawn out process, you should come away with some nice looking fantasy trees.
I always leave a little bit of the wire exposed at the bottom of the tree. That way I can douse it in Mod Podge and then stick it into the foam. And the PVA glue will hold better than any other glue out there. I cover up all the little gaps and mishaps with a little bit more of that clump foliage to act as brushes and brambles. And then we're on to the glamour shots. Alright, well it's official. I'm calling these things battle tiles. I appreciate all of y'all for sticking around and watching. If you haven't yet, be sure to hit the like button, leave a comment, tell me what you think about the terrain and the ideas you have for terrain. Hit the subscribe button if you haven't yet, and we'll see y'all on the other end of the trail.